Hello everyone, welcome to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce and today I have a special guest with us. Uh, he is an author and he has a new book that's out and it's a queer horror comedy called The Erstwhile Tyler Cow. By the way, he's also a horror academic in Monsters and Monsters. I have with us Steve Westenra. Westenra, got it. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> Steve, welcome to the Horror Realm. Thank you so much. <laughs> really happy to be here, Travis. And awesome this is, pleasure. This is my cat, Virgil, who chose exactly this moment to, like, climb on me. Hi, Virgil. <laughs> I'm a cat owner, too. And, and cats, yes, they, they love attention and they love... To hop in on, on inappropriate times. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's very he's very into that. I was like, I wasn't earlier. I was worried you were that you might think I was rolling my eyes at you because I was like looking up, but I was actually just uh, looking at him like literally, <laughs> like it's like okay, I see, I see something's about to happen now. So, <laughs> yeah, you see that you see me do that a lot in my interviews. I'll dip over and people are looking like, is he looking at script or something? No, I'm looking yeah. like that. Making sure that she's not jumping up on me. Exactly. Yeah, about to sort of like you know <laughs> knock over the. Moon. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Steve, yeah. tell us a little bit about the erstwhile Tyler Cow. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll try and give my like Twitter pitch because you know we all we all have to come up with these like pithy, you know, several line long like like pitches. So that's probably the easiest way to go. Um, so so to do that, it's about a cryptid hunting uh, YouTube darling uh, who's a skeptic on his like cryptid hunting channel. Um, and he receives a video from a uh, fan slash stalker um, that features his presumed dead mother, who was a B movie bombshell uh, kind of you know celebrity uh, horror film actress uh, who I based on Elvira. <laughs> and nice. um, yeah, and and so he uh, follows this video of her to an isolated island in the Canadian wilderness. Uh, that was formerly a gay conversion camp and may house the monsters he swears aren't real. And he does this kind of all while fleeing his, uh, you know, quote unquote, straight co-host, uh, you know, whom he drunkenly made out with. And they had a bit of a blow up about it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so that's it. The, the pithy uh, Twitter pitch version of what the book is about. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Now, now, Steve, this is a wild fucking story. <laughs> what gave you yeah. inspiration for it? <laughs> oh man it's it's honestly so many different things um it started out actually with like uh one of my friends so this is like one of those a friend of a friend type stories um mm -hmm. so so my friend nicole when we were like in our early 20s or it might have even been high school um i'm 38 now just for reference so this is that long ago and well, 41 um, so you, you're fine we're in a perfect yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're vibing um, yeah <laughs> with the elder millennials i think we're called yes yes yeah. that's what we're called. <laughs> yeah. um so so my friend nicole had had this friend and he went to like I, I don't remember his name and i don't remember the island's name and she didn't know it at the time but he went to this weird island which i'm pretty sure was in uh the saint lawrence river uh in quebec and like you could only get in by like plane and there was wow. like when he was there it was super weird like it was all owned by this one guy like this dude just like ran the island um and every i remember like one of the weird things like that i was told was like everything was laminated and for some reason the, the guy who owned the island his picture was everywhere um so like yeah it was just oh, like weird weird already started. yeah um, so i was like this is great this is a story right here um and so i came up with this story at the time about this like for like biology student who was kind of like closeted or like maybe unsure of himself or there's some kind of like um queer awkwardness going on there and uh being a biology student the, the focus of the story was slightly different so he goes to the island in that case to like investigate this like uh rare uh you know either bird or dog i hadn't decided that was on the island and like you know weird shit happens he encounters the placemats and the laminated shit and like the the mayor and so like parts of that are still in the book um but i did change it to somebody who was perhaps a bit more like close to me in terms of the kind of work uh that they do uh where it's sort of like a bit more creatively focused um so he's like a theater school grad which i am not but i'm you know i have a friend who is and my my parents are involved in amateur theater uh so i have a kind of grounding in it 
and obviously I do creative stuff, so there's that. Um, whereas, like, I've never, you know, I enjoyed biology in high school, but that, like, is the limit of, like, my knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, and also, the, like, another, uh, th these all sound totally out of left field in terms of inspirations, um, probably, because, like, if you haven't read the book, it won't be clear what character is related to them. But there is this kind of megalomaniacal mayor who runs the island in the book. Um, and his portrait is everywhere on the island. Um, I based him also a little bit on this figure from uh, Newfoundland uh, history and media history called Jeff Sterling. And mm -hmm. he was like this media mogul in the province I grew up in, Newfoundland, uh, you know, throughout the 20th century. And he was kind of batshit. <laughs> like, he just, he was a bit of a weird recluse. And he was also like massively into drugs. And, he came up with this weird Newfoundland superhero. Like, he believed in, like, Atlantis and all. Of, like, he was kind of L. Ron Hubbardy a little bit. Mm -hmm. And he, he had this Newfoundland superhero called Captain Newfoundland. And, like, would play, like, he owned the one of the local TV stations, Newfoundland Television and TV. And he required that they play, like, all of these trippy, like, scenes of, like, Captain Newfoundland flying around with all these weird colors in the background and, like, just like weird shit so i grew up watching this and like part of that Love was it. kind of the fuel for like the weirdness that is this book um but also stuff like david lynch twin peaks that kind of thing silent hill the silent hill games Love um, games. yeah yeah <laughs> perfect yeah um and more recently like um i don't know if you've seen it but like the um youtube show i kind of as a sort of pseudo model for the characters i used like um, the dudes from, like, BuzzFeed Unsolved slash Ghost Files. Um, yes. mm -hmm. Yeah, so they were kind of, like, a little bit of a model for the characters to an extent. Um, not in a, like, fan fiction way, but more in a sort of, like, um, I needed some kind of, apart from my own sort of, like, experiences that I was drawing on, some kind of, like, conceptual thing for the YouTube element that I wanted to bring in. Um, and so I kind of drew on that a little bit for it. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, because <laughs> I can imagine, you know, you know, being in the LGBT community in society, it's probably a horror story every single every single day. You know, what I mean, <laughs> it's probably a horror story every single day. So, yeah. like to to like tap on that as well as you know the elements of you know this your know, life these stories with the the islands. Or I, I I can imagine. I mean, this is something that is going to grasp a lot of people's attentions that, you know, probably would be like, oh, I see myself in that character. I can see myself in this one. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. And, and that's obviously, like, a deeper inspiration on that level, like, which I totally ignored in favor of the shallow inspirations. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, just, like, you know, uh, so much of the, like, my friend asked me for this, like, kind of, com almost like this, really, like, a kind of conversational interview that we were doing, where we mm -hmm. co-interviewed each other. He asked, you know, like, what is the major theme or a major theme that you'd like to highlight about the book? And the one I kind of settled on was the one that I was thinking about a lot at the start of writing it, which was this theme of yearning um, and particularly a kind of yearning in a queer context. So like, I think one thing that probably a lot of queer people um, can relate to or speak to are these sort of like, especially early relationships that a lot of queer people have where they're sort of like homosocial relationships. So like friendships with people, um, you know, of the same gender or the same sex um, that, you know, they straddle the line almost between platonic friendships and kind of romantic relationships. And there's always this kind of like, we're not, I shouldn't say always, but a lot of people have that experience of having these really deep, kind of feelings perhaps for a friend as like as a first kind of like uh you know romantic interest or experience and maybe not fully understanding that or like maybe you neither of you understand it maybe you're both queer like you know it, it happens in all kinds of different ways and so like i think a lot of us kind of experience a degree of kind of um negative feeling to do with that and so that was something i wanted to pull on a little bit and that I was perhaps a bit raw for me that I'd kind of like, um, and, and personal. And I, I think I'd like toyed with it in other books before, but I never really quite was willing to go there entirely with it. Um, 
And so I decided with this one to, to kind of go there with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, now, is that something that happens for you, you say, often in the queer community where, you know, you, you gain this um, uh, uh, friendship with someone of the same sex and you start getting feelings for them, but they may not reciprocate it or they may not be queer? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, I mean, it's not a situation like... I mean, this is something that the queer community, at, you know, like, not that it's a homogenous thing, but, like, yeah. uh, you know, ha have fought against this perception that, like, oh, you have a gay friend, they're obviously, like, attracted to you or going to hit on you. That's not the case. Like, that's absolutely not the case. But I think, you know, like, thinking back to, like, being young, um, and I think this happens to straight people, too. You know, like, you, you have a friend and you have someone you're really close to, and especially if it's someone you have an extended friendship with, um, over the course of, like, puberty or something, or then into your 20s even, um, you know, like, if you're particularly close with someone, it's very hard in a, in a way when you're going through things together not, I think, to kind of develop some kinds of feelings like that. And, of course, people also, like, uh, whether you're, you're queer or straight, like, uh, people experiment with each other. Uh, mm -hmm. during those ages too right so like there's yeah. also that side of it um and i think that can cause some you know com complications in, in terms of mm -hmm. those uh those relationships um but yeah like that that was a big part of it for me i think was like what started out as me kind of expressing something personal um but then sort of later realizing uh like the the more queer people i met as i got older the more common an experience i realized it was um and so I think that for me sort of made it more important to tell because then it's not just yeah. like, oh, I'm kind of like venting some kind of personal yeah. navel gazy <laughs> yeah. trauma. It's like, or, or you know, like, uh, or exercising in a cathartic way these kinds of feelings. It's, it's um, a more common experience. And maybe um, if somebody who's like, you know, in their 20s or whatever is reading this, like that could be helpful for them, uh, you know, in, in some kind of a way. So, um yeah, because cause, I mean, I've not, never done this person, but I mean, heterosexual, queer, whatever. I've heard that you know, never fuck your friends. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, you know n never like in a weak moment hook up with one of your friends or right. Like that <laughs> it it rarely, I mean, it rarely turns into anything. It usually breaks and they make things awkward. Yeah, um, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I think. I like a lot of it's to do with probably like my own specific weirdness and the weirdness of, of probably other people I've met, I guess. <laughs> I, I think it just really depends. Like mm -hmm. um, a lot of people who have really successful relationships start out as friend for friends first. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I would hazard a guess that most people don't like, you know, have a hookup at a bar with a random person. And then yeah. that ends up being like, you know, exactly. the, the person they end up with for their entire life or something. So usually, I hope not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but if it does, good for them, I guess. Yeah, no, right? you know, I know. I guess to be fair, like the other option that I'm ignoring is that people could like intentionally go on dates, which always seemed like such a foreign concept to me. And actually, mm -hmm. I think that's maybe the the key here for the queer part because, like, in a lot of situations, even today, that's not necessarily an option because it's often something you're trying to like work out covertly, right? So. Uh, particularly, like, with the age you and I are, like, you know, um, it might not necessarily always have been safe, or it might not have been something you could be open about looking for, especially if you grow up in a small community, like, mm -hmm. so the place I'm from, uh, and a lot of the other queer people that I know are from, are these small communities, so, like, it wasn't necessarily, like, oh, we're gonna set each other up and go on dates, and, like, we're gonna you know, it took a while for plenty of fish to come along and all of these, like, now archaic, yeah. uh, you know, dating sites, and certainly not, like, things like Tinder or whatever um, back then. But but I guess that's what a lot of, like, people do, actually, is, is go on dates, now that I'm saying that. But the yeah. queer people, <laughs> that's not necessarily always the case. It's always an option, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so before online dating, what was the option? Like, how, how do you... Like, I'm queer, you're queer, we don't know each other. How do we... <laughs> come together i i think that's the trick is like um so there, there's a long history to this so like uh sometimes there could be usually it was through cues so depending on the degree of danger um those cues might be different so you know uh throughout the the 20th century and the 19th century even you would sometimes have like visual cues like wearing particular kinds of clothing 
uh, or like, uh, you know, for, for gay men for a long time, it was like having one of your ears pierced was mm -hmm. like a sign. And it was like specifically your left ear, I believe. Um, right ear. It was the right one. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah. So like, you know, things like that, right. That would be sort of like a visual uh, signal to somebody um, or wearing like a particular flower uh, in your lapel or something like that. Um, but, you know, I certainly that culture didn't exist where I was growing up. And, and I didn't have anybody saying like, these are the things that you look for. This is what you do. And I didn't even necessarily have the vocabulary to kind of like, I think, describe myself properly or even recognize like what I was looking for or who I was in terms of like, a you know, sexual identity. So I think it was more just sort of like, and, and not that this is a good thing, but um, just really subtle vibes off of people um, that kind of thing. If you lived in the city, so I, like, the, the capital city of, of Newfoundland is really more of a town. We just call it town. <laughs> so St. John's, the, the capital, um, was a bit more cosmopolitan. Like, there was a gay bar. So, like, if you were older than 18 or you had a fake ID, I guess, um, you could, you could get into this bar and I, you'd meet people probably that way. Um, not necessarily just to hook up with, but, but to, like, make friends or get introduced to some others in the community. And then, uh, you know, one, one thing about like small queer communities, and this is true, um, in Newfoundland a lot is that you all gradually end up dating each other's exes and the exes of your exes. And like, you know, you're all supposed to also be friends still because it's a small enough community that it's like, you know, you can't like, it, it's, it's, it's too much to like, I don't want to hang out with that person. So like, yeah. it's like all your exes are having like the same party together and they're also all each other's exes. And like, you just all have a barbecue because like, that's the community. <laughs> <laughs> I hear it's the same way with the, the side of a lot of friends who are, are lesbians and they right. seem like to date each other. Oh, like oh God. They yes. like date. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they just circle around in a circle dating each other. Yep. Yep. The less like, the lesbians are the worst for it, I will say. Um, like, <laughs> lesbian drama is a very specific thing. And, like, in Newfoundland, like, too, like, so Newfoundland Pride is in July rather than June. And, like, um, there was the one of the big events of Newfoundland Pride was, like, the this big gay bonfire at the beach. So it was in this little cove. And, like, these buses would come and bring everyone to the cove. And everyone would have their little fires and stuff. And just, like... Each time I went, it just, like, degenerated at a certain point to lesbian drama of people going over to the different <laughs> fires and, like, starting shit and, like, getting increasingly drunk and then playing spin the bottle and, like, and just, like, uh, you know, like, yeah, it was it was always, uh, it was really funny. Like, it was always really funny. Uh, I thought it was entertaining, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> from the outside, from the outside watching in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I was internal to this, like, you know, <laughs> which is not great, but, but. You know, I, th I think I was mostly, I, I didn't date a lot, to be honest. I was very, like, I think part of that probably comes from just being the kind of person that I am, like, um, kind of more insular and, and neurodivergent and that kind of thing. And, like, I didn't live in town, so it was also hard to, like, get out to town to meet people. This sounds really hilarious. <laughs> um, there's no public transit in Newfoundland and shit. So, like, um, okay. yeah, so, so, like, you know, um, I didn't, like, date a lot of people. Or anything like that. So mostly I was, like, observing other people's drama. But occasionally I would end up, like, involved in the drama. But usually as, like, a peripheral person, almost. Um, a spectator, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, friend friend of a friend. Or, like, somebody, like, I would have a crush on, like, a friend's significant other. And then they'd start to break up. And then their, the ex-significant other would start hitting on me. And I'd be kind of interested. But, like, I'm way too, like, like... I like to know people for a really long time. So like, I'm too slow in terms of like yeah. how fast I move with things. So it wouldn't go anywhere, but like this happened several times. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, like yeah, I'm gonna sound like a really shitty person, but like I've been in situations, not recently, but let's say in the past where like I was in a, in a relationship with a woman and yeah. then she would bring, this is why I would, I would advise everyone, especially women, do not bring your female friends around your dude, especially in the beginning, right? Especially in the beginning. 
um, wait until things are serious, serious before you introduce. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, because what happens is you run into that you, you run into the risk where the guy that you're, you're you're newly talking to might be interested in one of your friends more than he's interested in you. Right. Could be, they could be physically, personality wise. They both have more in common. Yeah. I've had that happen numerous times, but there's no way properly to transition of like, hey, you know what? Yeah. I'm into your fucking friend. Like, there's no way that, that's a douche move. Like, that's something you yeah. can do as a guy. But um, I definitely, I've definitely had with women I was dating, and I introduced them to my guy friends, and then they wound up banging my guy friends. Like, right. But at the same time, <laughs> We weren't in relationships, and like women can do right. that, which which is kind of unfair. But no <laughs> one judges a woman for for, for that. Like that. <laughs> they do. They they do sometimes. I think it's just the kind of judgment is perhaps a little different. Like yeah. I, I've I've seen that happen with female friends of mine, and usually there's like a lot of ostracization that will happen and slut shaming. That kind of stuff tends yeah. to be more what what goes on. Um, but yeah, I think you make a really good point. I think like when you're early in a relationship, especially because it's like, you know, and, and say you're both like actively looking for people mm-hmm. like, you know, say you met on, met on Plenty of Fish or whatever, or Tinder, yeah. whatever the kids are using nowadays. Went on a couple of dates, been talking for a month. Yeah. No one has said anything about let's be in a relationship. Yeah. I think it's way too early to be introducing friends. Yeah, yeah. And then it, there's also the awkwardness of like, what if it ends up not going anywhere? even with you guys or something and like you know like I, I don't know there's just some weird there there is a potential for weirdness there and that's happened to me too where like uh my my friend will hate me telling this story because it makes her look really bad <laughs> um, but but you know we were both really young we were both in our 20s and it's not like I didn't do shit as well but um like I I was bad at meeting people and so like my my friend kind of set me up with this happened twice to two different people um, and was like, oh, you'll really like this person and put in a lot of work to convince me that I would like them and sent me pictures of them from like Facebook and stuff. And then like was like, OK, I'm going to organize you to go on a date and th- that kind of thing. And then like two days later would like send me a kind of sheepish message on like Facebook. that was like, so, you know how like me and like Jillian <laughs> hung out. Jillian's a made up name. Um, <laughs> just you know, Jillian, like, hung out the other night, well, we ended up having a lot of sex, <laughs> and, like, oh. <laughs> and then, like, I, I just, like, it would always be just as I was starting to get interested as well, like, because I was always yeah. kind of skeptical, like, <laughs> um, and yeah. so, like, that happened twice <laughs> with the same friend, <laughs> and, like, oh. it just became really, it became really funny, like, I find it a really funny story now, like, oh. you know, <laughs> So yes. like that kind of stuff can happen. Like you 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 aren't invested that deeply with each other yet, and like and so there's still that part of your brain probably that's like, well, I, I'm looking generally, and then maybe you hit it off better with the friend that you're introduced to or something. Yeah, you know, uh, so, yeah. And, and and I can only speak from the guy side. Like um, also too like like I mean I don't know if men fucking do this probably do, but like. Like, if you introduce um, a guy to your girlfriends way too soon, when that's me, to be honest, you, you might not want to introduce them at all. But I'm saying, if you do it way too soon, women have a, a, a I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or not, but they have a, a problem with releasing information about their friend's past that they shouldn't. And I don't know if they're doing it in like a C blocking way or they're like, oh, what happened to that firefighter guy with the with, with the uh, big, with the big dick you were talking to like two weeks ago? And you're uh, like, I don't know that. I've I've had that happen. Oh no! Every I'm single sorry. time, but 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 sometimes that happens like way on. We're in a serious relationship, and it, it doesn't yeah. bother. Me. But like in the beginning stages, when a woman releases, when one of her girlfriends releases that type of information, it makes me not interested anymore. Right. It's well. It seems kind of like a a power move in a way. It's like, you know, like if somebody says something like that, and and starts talking, like in, inserts a third party who's not present and arguably isn't relevant a into like, a, a, yeah, a, yeah, like pass. a conversation. It feels like like you're you're being compared to somebody you can't compete with because essentially they're not real anymore. It's like they're, yeah. they're again, you don't know them. You you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah. like, that's that's awkward, definitely. So, definitely. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so let's just jump back to your book. Um, <laughs> I like going on rants. 
But, oh no, um, it's okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, me too. <laughs> it makes an interview more fun. But um, exactly, yeah, and relatable. <laughs> All right. So when it came to your book, so there's a lot of moving pieces that's going on in your book. Yeah. So, <laughs> so tell me about the process of getting this on paper. Did you already have an ending in mind, or was that something that you had to work your way towards? Yeah. So like, um, I I tend to be like. I always describe myself as like in terms of like the the uh, the plotter pincer dynamic. Like I, I think most people are some kind of in between mix of that, ultimately. Um, but I actually like much prefer sort of like the like gardener architect kind of like way of talking about it. Um, but I, I like I had the thing is is like it's always kind of random like what I come up with to start. So like sometimes I'll have lots of like really specific imagery or, or really specific scenes or moments uh, or a really specific feeling that I want to kind of evoke in the reader um, through the book. And maybe, maybe those are the only things I, I know concretely. Um, and then other times like it might be a lot more fleshed out than that. So it kind of depends book to book. Um, with this one, I, I definitely like, the vibe of it, the atmosphere, uh, the emotional response I wanted from the reader, those were things that were very clear to me. Um, and, you know, elements of the plot were very clear as well, um, though I did ultimately end up changing some that were quite significant, including the ending. Um, yeah, so, like, I started writing it, and I think the thing, the hardest thing for me before I could really get uh, an idea of the the whole thing was working out the character voice and the character voice in this book in particular uh is really kind of crucial to the whole thing um so it's told in first person it's definitely one of those books that like you know people describe voicey books sometimes right mm -hmm. you would definitely describe this book that way um he's right there on the page he's uh you know hopefully right there on the page very lively very dynamic um, has a clear point of view, those kinds of things. Um, but I think, you know, like, there's always a point with writing when I don't quite have that figured out. And until I, I have that figured out, I almost can't properly start writing, if that makes sense. So, like, I might write a couple of chapters, um, preliminary chapters, but then I might stop and not write anything else because, like, something about the character voice isn't there yet for me. So it's like, before I can continue writing the book, I, I have to have that sense of character because everything is always going to for me be filtered through that person that person's context um so their past their history their present um you know who they are their identity like all of that is going to factor into like how um the plot is then uh sort of presented for the reader um because any i i'm a big um fan of talking about any narrator as an unreliable narrator to an extent. So we all filter everything, all our experiences through, uh, you know, our subjectivity, through our context, through all of the things that make us individually us, right? So we're all unreliable reader, uh, narrators to an extent. Um, that doesn't mean we're lying. Um, it just means that we're all subjective uh, experiencers, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I think that's one of the things that's really key for me to have first. Um, and then I do, like, I like the way you put that, like, things you're moving toward. Um, I do tend to have that. Sometimes it's, like, not the ending. Sometimes it's specific scenes. Um, in this case, uh, I, I'm going to, like, are you okay with me giving a spoiler? Go ahead. I mean, it's up yeah. to you. I mean, it's your Okay, fault. yeah. <laughs> I'll just say, like, spoiler warning. Spoiler alert, everyone. Yeah. Spoiler. Um, yeah. Um, I won't be specific. But I will say the ending was going to be originally be a lot more bleak. Um, than it is in the book. It wasn't going to have um, the ending that it has now, which I won't tell you what it is. Um, like, I'm not guaranteeing a happy ending or anything like that, because I don't like to guarantee those things. It's very much a book, I think, that works when you don't know what's going to happen. But it was going to have a bleak ending. And then my, my critique partner um, was like, but why couldn't it have, like, this other kind of ending? And I was like, well, you know, like, and I think... You know, then I thought about it, and I was like, yeah, like, I'll, you know, I, I like that, actually. And then at that point, I, I kind of, like, in my mind, concretized a lot more of the stuff that was going to happen at the very, very end. And then I was always constantly, like, working toward that. So at that, you know, like, before, um, before I'd 
you know, like I, I didn't pants it basically. <laughs> like yeah, like yeah. I, at that point I sort of had, had, you know, enough idea. And like, I'm somebody who likes to put in lots of um, little, like, they're not qu- like, they are foreshadowing, but, but not quite, but I like to have sort of like uh, a friend of mine put it this way, sort of like everything, even imagery in, in a piece uh, has its own arc that kind of stuff. So, like, you know, I like to to have um, things recur, uh, symbols recur, that kind of stuff, or, like, I'm really fond of closing by return, which just means, like, uh, returning to some element that you put at the beginning, at the very end. It could be a symbol or an image, or uh, it could be a literal event or a location. You know, it can be interpreted in a lot of ways, but I'm really fond of that, so, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 like, I, listen, I, creators i guess i'm a creator but i'm talking about real yeah. creators like, like 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 you know filmmakers and musicians and authors i respect you guys so damn much oh. <laughs> because because i i mean the way that your brains work because you know i talk to a lot of authors and a lot of them are ponderers or you, uh, i think it's the term or Putters. Yes. Oh, putters, yeah. yeah. Putters are, they're, they're putters and they put away. But some, like, yeah. have an ending and they work their way forward. And I'm like, damn, how the fuck do you do that? But I, I started thinking about it. I'm like, wait a minute. What I do my, so I don't have no script or anything when I do my interviews. I have your name and nice. <laughs> what your project is, right? And yeah. then, but I already have, because I've done some research on your pro- project, I already have my ending question already oh, in perfect. mind. Yeah. And then as my guest is talking, yeah, I start questions start popping in my head, and I start categorizing them in my head, so I know exactly once they finish this, I know what my follow up. So there's there's no awkward silence in my interviews. Yeah, because I've already <laughs> got a list of questions that are constantly populating in my head. Wonderful. But like so, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, I guess maybe that's something <laughs> authors do because yeah. like, yeah, that sounds really. Constantly. It sounds really similar, honestly, like to kind of what I do with books, because like stuff will come up in the process of writing all the time, like that that's new or that it's like, oh, I didn't never. Re- it almost feels sometimes like I never realized this was the way it had to be, but it so clearly is the way it always had to be based on what I had written, have written already, and based on where I'm going. Um, so it has the feel of spontaneity, but also the feeling of like that it, it's gr- entirely grounded in what was there as the foundation. So in your case, that last question, like it's kind of almost like it's guiding toward that, that point. Yes. But it's, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and as my guest is talking, the other questions pop in, like, you know, we just had a whole conversation about queer dating. Yeah. That was, <laughs> I was not planning on doing that, but like, but you yeah. started up and then I was like, okay, let's put that into the, I think this would be interesting to, for anybody. Plus I would like to know, like, I love, <laughs> I love educating. I don't like to listen. I love yeah. learning. I love, knowing a little bit about everything. I mean, I know everything about everything, but I like to know a little <laughs> bit about everything. Because yeah. also, also, too, I like to, when it comes to just people in general, because I like to, I would never want to offend anyone. I would like to respect For sure. people and, and, and know what they think and what is their life is like, because we're all fucking different. Oh, definitely, yeah. And, like, and along those lines, I will say, like, my experiences with queer dating are going to be vastly different than, like, a lot of people's because again i wasn't really dating like i was mm-hmm. kind of like to the side of the community and i was awkward and weird in different ways and like you know and also like the age that we are and the place that you know i, I grew up in so yeah <laughs> but I, yeah because I, I mean I, I know a lot of women are probably comment how's your fucking asshole well, you, you but why can't you introduce <laughs> my friends but listen every single guy is going to comment i would never ever introduce my guy friend to my girlfriend wife whatever because they know that they're guys that are fucking assholes and sleazeballs. That's the reason why. We know that guys are fucking sleazeballs and assholes. So, so yeah. So, uh, so any woman in my life has always asked me, well, we're not going to be your friends. The answer is never. Like, let me stumble upon them at the fucking mall or something. Because I, I've had an experience with well, Trevor's. Well, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yo, shut the fuck up. Why, why, why is that important? Like, why are you bringing up something I did fucking 20 years ago? Like, is that important? Like, right, right, are you, yeah. Are you, cops, are you trying to fucking cop block me or something? Yeah, yeah. that's not good. <laughs> yeah, I know. Jesus. So that's my experience. Of why I, I, I don't do that shit. But right. um, so listen, let's, let's jump to something else. So you're an <laughs> academic who studies monsters and the monstrous. What does yeah. that mean? 
Yeah. Um, so like my, like there's lots of people who work in this kind of subfield and often from like a different perspective. So you have people who are coming at it from like, you know, religious studies, uh, people who are coming at it from sociology, like all different kinds of like, you know, overarching fields, right? Or lit literary studies is a big one. So, so, or the study of film um, and it can intersect. Um, so, you know, like, it, it's quite broad, the kinds of stuff that gets worked on. For me, specifically, uh, what I study is, is I actually research, like, the representation of marginalized people, uh, like, broadly speaking, as being monsters. Um, so, like, the use of monsters, uh, historically, um, including in a contemporary context, um, as sort of figures used to, like, um, argue that like a class of people uh aren't human or subhuman and therefore can be treated um you know badly right so um generally speaking that tends to be where where uh you know my research goes um re getting even more specific what i'm looking at like in terms of like uh, my phd is like modern instances where like marginalized authors and other kinds of creatives um, are actually reclaiming these monstrous figures and sort of saying, no, I, I didn't, you know, you've represented me um, as a monster. Um, so I'm taking this figure back now and I'm actually going to use that uh, figure of the monster uh, as a source of identification that's positive for me. Uh, so sometimes you'll see this in like kind of revenge stories. Um, so like, you know, um, a short story maybe where where somebody is like, uh, talking through their, their trauma of being, um, you know, like a, a non-binary Asian Canadian or something. And so, uh, and, and what that felt like, uh, you know, as an experience and in their story, maybe they represent themselves as like the creature from the Black Lagoon or something like that. And they're like getting revenge on all their bullies or, uh, you know, they're, oh. they're starting a new uh, civilization where people like them can flourish and, we're getting rid of all the humans now. They they don't belong in the society. The society is just for us, kind of a thing. So, um, you know, stories where that kind of stuff happens. That's sort of what I'm what I'm looking at in terms of my research. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty fucking awesome. That's Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right, fun. Steve. You've watched my channel, and I yeah. do this every once in a while. <laughs> I'm asking you three random hard questions. These are your personal opinion. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Are you ready? Yes, I am ready. <laughs> All right, the first question was, what monster would you feel like they, do you feel like you relate to the most? Oh, <laughs> I think like, oh, it's changed. Um, I always answer that my favorite, my favorite monsters have historically always been vampires, um, which probably won't surprise because there's quite a history of like queerness and, and vampires being particularly associated. And one of my first favorite monster, uh, you know, stories was was dracula um but when i was a very young child i had like an imaginary werewolf friend called wolfie because i was super creative oh. um <laughs> yeah well, and all my stuffed animals were called things like this as well it was like i had a parrot who was called parrot you know like um, anyway um, <laughs> and um i think like you know so there's still that part of me where the the vampire calls to me very much um, but I think also I've, I've come to like, through sort of like, um, the, the work of like, you know, the, the universal film is really, uh, identify and feel for sort of like Frankenstein's monster a lot as well. Um, I would say is a good one. Um, yeah, but it's, it's hard to say cause like it, it, you know, each one kind of has their own tug, their own, like, you know, emotional yeah. hold on me to an extent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you with a vampire. Um, one of the reasons for me is I'm a nocturnal person. I love, ah. I, I'm a night person. As, as we're nice. going to a interview at <laughs> almost 10 o'clock at night. But I do all my interviews, like, late, late as shit at night. I do all my editing at night. I'm a night person. Wonderful. Um, I love the night. I get my energy from the night. Um, I'm I'm not a morning person. I'm not a day person. I yeah. I, I I definitely I'm old. I'm older now, so I don't. I'm not out at the clubs fucking partying like no. on a uh, Friday night. <laughs> but uh, um, I definitely am a night person. I I get my energy. I can get a lot more done at night than I am during the day. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good. That's a really good reasoning, actually. So yeah, I always like aesthetically loved the night, but like naturally, my body's rhythm is like to to wake up really early, and I get like tired really early as well. Um, but the worst is the middle of the day. I like just fall, start oh. to like drop at like three. I'm a napper. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a napper. It's a good move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.